Truth is Order, and Order is Truth, by Nadia Balkin. I didn't go alone into the outer darkness. A huddled legion came with me, men and women and children, all of whom would have been purged for their devotion to my mother. My mother was dead, so she could not summon any army. My father was dead as well, so he could not protect me. But I was alive, their only child, and I'd promised my mother's followers that I would deliver us to strength and sanctuary in my mother's homeland, Jongkuno. Because all the rivers flow north, and Jongkuno is on the southern shore, we had to go over land. We had no soldiers. Those men were loyal to the Prime Minister, Jayamagalang. He was their god. They would have followed him anywhere. It was to my parents' credit that the soldiers let us pass through the brick, the brick split gate. We had but one healer, a very old man who I didn't think understood what he was giving up. They were my f mother's friends, disgraced and confused and clinging to their jewelry, more convinced than I that we would, tell, that we would rally an army in Jonkuno and retake the Alunijo throne. There were farmers. I'd expected them all to be farmers because they were the ones whose crops my mother blessed with irrigation. Then there were my mother's servants, some of whom would have been gladly buried with her, others who just had no family to vouch for them. These few slogged behind, bemoaning their fate and the insects and the heat. Except for the reluctant servants, they came of their own accord. No, they didn't choose to trek through the infested rainforest toward a half-forgotten kingdom, but they did choose to bow to my mother Daya, to call her Mother of Kingdoms, to see divine providence in her. They saw her truth as stark as the silent face of a cold white moon. Once you have looked into her eyes, once her fingers have grazed your scalp, she is hard to shake. She was my mother, I should know. When I walked away from Jayamagalang for the last time, when he laid bare his sordid accusations against my mother, he yelled, Who knows where you come from? You belong to the outer darkness. I bit my bottom lip until my mouth filled with blood so he would honor my request to rebury my, my mother's bones. Then I forced myself to continue walking past the dead king's banyans through the brick-split gate, and into the wilderness that birthed me. Jaya Megaling called my mother a shaman queen. He dug her up and locked and looked her under her shroud and said her skeleton was misshapen, that her eyes were too large and her mouth too wide. He said her fingers and toes had grown too long from too much magic. He said she consorted with demons while my father secured Maluku and her body paid the price. This was ludicrous because my mother had been agelessly beautiful. The concubines stood no chance against her, which is why they pinned their hopes for power on their sons, my half-brothers. I wasn't worried at first. I didn't care that Arda and Murti were men who looked like my father because I was his only legitimate child, and then he Jaya Megalang, our prime minister, said my mother, or the sorceress, had been unfaithful, that I wasn't really blood. As early as my father's funeral procession, I could feel the landscape shifting, temples coming down, houses going up, clouds moving fast as warships. I realized after I screamed at a maid who bought the garden's last jet, who brought the garden's last jackfruit to Arda instead of me, that I had lost my footing. Jayamagalang had a far stronger voice and reach. Amassing power was not a skill I'd been taught between courtly dance and batik painting. Sycophantic courtesans went slithering after Arda's heels, whispering things about my mother, each more terrible than the last. My ministers would not meet with me. I had been buried, alive with my parents. A gap-toothed child, a gap-toothed child grabbed my hand and asked, 
What would Jung Kuno be like? I didn't have an answer. So I murmured, My mother's people will meet us. Do you remember my mother? She was the queen. We will hear them singing. They will give us crowns of seashells. We will eat fish. We will swim home. I don't know what I was saying after that. The air was so heavy, the ground so unsteady. I remember squeezing the child's hand until someone snatched the sprite away. I heard whispers of, Princess! I didn't know who that princess was. I had never been to Junkuno. None of us had. All I knew was that my mother ate spiny purple crabs in what she called harbor style, raw and salted, and told only one story about Junkuno, and only when I was feverish. It began, My mother and father live under the sea. I don't remember the rest, except for bone fragments about a thousand siblings, whirlpools and swimming all, all the way up to father's golden eyes. They were an opiate. I asked for them nightly, even pretending to be sick until she shook me off. You aren't ready, she said. She'd come inside Elenijo's brick walls to pay tribute and renew ties on the 20th anniversary of Junkuno's acquiescence to the Elenijo Empire. By then, the man who'd subordinated Junkuno, King Tunga, was dead, and it was my father Sora who was sitting in the pavilion when she emerged from under the banyans, this wide-eyed woman wearing so much gold she was shining. Sea music, the kind you hear from a conch, flooded his ears. The hermits said it meant she was the mother of kingdoms, so my father married her right away. Her few attendants disappeared soon after. She never went back. I asked if she got homesick, and she said, The water is too shallow here. Which I took to mean yes. Maps couldn't decide exactly where Junkuna was. Behind that cove? On that headland? On some days, trees didn't seem to change and bad thoughts would worm in like ants chewing under fingernails. Junkuno does not exist. My mother was insane. I have killed us. Jaya Megalang cast his wives aside, like rotting fruit, and hated kneeling to my mother and me. I felt the sourness of his hate and snapped my teeth at him like a cornered dog. Once. I called him an impotent ogre. He called me a demon. I was seventeen. You need to humor him, my, mo- my father said. This was years before he was trampled by the elephant. My father believed he could control everything and had indeed expanded the empire to Maluku and tamed the Bugis. But his mind weakened after my mother died. What proud general wants a little girl talking back to him? My brothers don't have to kiss his feet, and they're not even princes. Arda and Murti also don't argue with him. Consider the battles he's won for us. Jaya Megaling once subdued a small, restless kingdom in western Java by arranging a marriage between their princess and my father, and then deciding after their ship docked in Alunijo that their princess was to be a concubine instead. They objected, so he killed the entire royal family. My father, only fifteen, sent them riches in atonement. Dani, the best kings and queens, know when to be diplomatic. So self-satisfied. You see? I did see, but I never bowed my chin deeply enough for Jaya Megaling. Couldn't stay out of matters of kingdom that were none of my concern. I said those were my matters because I was the future queen. He said I never listened. And when I said I saw no reason to listen to a bitter old soldier, he spat, You'll never be queen, you spoiled wretch. That is why he called my mother a shaman queen, and I a creature of the outer darkness. Tigers stayed away from us. 
The jungle is full of them. They carry off scavenging children, but they left our children alone. One night, I saw amber eyes peering at me through foliage. But when I shifted my gaze for a moment, they disappeared. My people cried, We are blessed, and Dea watches over us. But I couldn't feel my mother anywhere in that suffocating greenery. I wondered if the tigers knew we were marked for something worse. About a week in, someone suggested that we should be on the coast by now. These destitute people, half mad with heat, looked to me for leadership and I froze, as if I were still staring at that tiger. Every forward step brought me closer to my greatest fear. I would make a terrible queen. They could have left me. They would have had the right. My title was worthless. I didn't know the way. I couldn't speak. I still believe it was fear of tigers that stopped them from deserting. But no matter, they gathered at my feet, stroked my hem, and muttered good luck incantations. A few days passed of this quiet praying, and then the old healer saw me cradling a woman so sick she seemed to melt, and asked if I wasn't scared of disease. By then we had lost four. Tigers may have ignored us, but flies and mosquitoes didn't. But plagues never touched me, nor my mother and father, I assumed because we were royalty. I once smiled when I heard a handmaid say Arda and Murti had water poison. She later told Jaya Megaling that I'd rejoiced at my brother's suffering, but it wasn't that. I'd rejoiced to know I was sole heir to my father's throne. No, I said, because I am my parents' daughter. I have their blood. This was nothing new, but from then on, their blood became a rallying cry. They tested me, fed me foul water and spoiled fish, had me bury the infected woman when she died, had me sleep in insect nests. Every time I survived, our collective trust in my being, in my essence and power, swelled. They threw themselves to the ground. I could have walked across their backs. My mother's death had undone me. I believed she would live forever. With that rule broken, nothing else seemed real. I started swimming maniacally, padding across dingy palace canals sleeping in rice paddies. My father sent me to a house on the beach to recover. If I had gotten hurt, I might have been shocked back to reality, but even when I crashed into a rock at sea, my body just swallowed the impact and washed ashore. I realized as I lay on the sand, watching black coconut fronds stir the white sky, that though the sun is blinding, we are ruled by a great dark truth. The first truth is this, people die. The second, there is a place beyond. My father took me home after I agreed to sleep indoors again and declared me cured. Truly, I was altered. When the elephant tossed him off its neck and crushed him, I did not cry. He has joined my mother, I said. I will see him in time. After my blood and I were hailed as bearers of the kingdom eternal, I made up my mind about four things. We were going south. We would continue until we reached Junkuno. There, I would receive my inheritance, and we would take back Alunijo. I rolled my conviction up with my people's devotion into a little leaden ball in my head that I called truth. At first, it was strange to carry truth inside me instead of worshipping its black shadow shape from a distance. But as soon as I accepted that these four things were true, the fecund jungle began to make sense. I started to smell sea salt and hear the caw of gulls under the giggles of jungle birds. I chose easygoing paths. A profound calm that only comes from self-assurance settled upon me. It can lead you into folly if you are like my father. So you must wind your focus tight as a closed fist, as my mother did, and listen not only to the whine of your own hunger, but to the roar of truth. In our final days in the jungle, 
I thought only of Jean Kuno, never of being queen. In my dreams, clouds roiled like tentacles above wind-whipped flags. There is a place, I cried when I was particularly overcome. My people cried with gratitude. A month after our father died, Murti and I met beside the pool where Arda once drowned a palace pup. Murti was just a little boy trying to grow a mustache. She was born when I was five. When he melted into crybaby tears, I'd often had to console him. You must leave, he said. Arda will hurt you if you stay. It was only natural that my brothers betrayed me. Nestling birds peck their siblings to death to eliminate competition for love or food. The boys' mothers always whispered to them at sun-baked ceremonies where they sat two rows behind me. But my mother whispered to me, too. You are the one, my sweet. You were made to be queen. I told Murti so. He'd read the law enough times. I was afraid to say it aloud, but if my mother was mother of kingdoms, the kingdom could only reside in me. Sister, I know, but the Prime Minister has the soldiers. They don't answer to you. His eye twitched. I think he was suggesting he become my minder and talk to men on my behalf. A terrible idea, since he was just a weak-spined scholar. They have no discipline, I said, and Jaime Magalang is a brute. Decline's already started. Since my mother died, it's been nothing but accidents and terrible weather. We have no luck at sea. Soon, all our rivals will come to our gates and start nibbling. Murti shook his head. Don't talk about decline, Donny. They don't want to hear it. Declined is a polite word to describe Junkuno. More accurate is probably abandoned. We saw the remains of houses, temples, guard posts. Now all was waterlogged and riddled with seaweed. Tiny white snails like maggots crawled across every man-made surface. And there was not a single soul. It felt as if we'd been delivered out of hell, only to find the world of the dead. We camped on the beach. There were scattered protests from those who wanted a roof after all this time. But I was taught not to go uninvited into the houses of strangers. The weather is fine, I said, trying to keep my voice calm because I too was close to ruin. We sleep outdoors. There was barely any talk, save when a girl shouted that the surf was full of fish. Then we quietly reaped that harvest that belonged to whoever had lived in those dark, time-eaten houses on the dunes. I didn't know if we'd survive this disappointment, if I could coax them to accept this dilapidated village as, compensated, as compensation for their lost membership in the Alunijo Empire. I went to sleep, curled like a nautilus. What else can you call a dark sea but the end of the world? Then, in the dead of night, they came, out of the houses and out of the sea. Those from the houses had long gills, like knife slices instead of ears. Their gray skin shone in the moonlight. Their mouths opened deep into their cheeks. Long, gangly fingers dangled at the end, at the ends of long, gangly arms. The ones from the sea looked even less human. They stood slumped and uncomfortable with water thrashing their legs. Princess Darni, said one from a house, who wore an old fishing net like a shawl. Its voice was too pure for its soggy corpse skin. Why did you come back? No one knew what to say. My people were so startled, still stuck in a restless sleep, that I don't think they understood it as language. I was the only one who could look at them without wanting to scream, because I had been looking into those black, bulbous eyes my entire life. My eyes in the mirror. My mother's eyes, after midnight. My father's eyes, when he was hungry. I have never been here before, I said. I don't know you. Truth. 
We are Wang Jeru, and you should be Queen of Alunijo. Little smile. Long teeth. Where is your mother? Your father? Both are dead, I said. And the creatures howled. After a few anxious heartbeats, I realized they were yelling, Murdered! No. My father had an accident. My mother had a sickness. I lost my voice, remembering her sudden disintegration. One day, we were watching the boats haul in fish, breathing in sea salt, because my mother said it kept us young. The next, she was dying, a blackened and bloody mess on a foul bed. I was ushered out. Princess might get sick. But what about our blood? The creatures did not like this explanation, either. They sounded like gulls, swarming a school of fish, and children began to cry. Sickness! Sickness! The one wearing the net lunged forward on thick frog legs and hissed. She was a daughter of Dagon. What sickness could touch a Wangjaru? Your mother was murdered, girl. It was the first time I heard the name of Father Dagon. This must have been how my birth father felt upon seeing my mother and hearing music swirl around her like a ribbon coming unwound. It isn't lust, nor fear. It's an awakening. It's the blow of the heavy gong of truth. I saw the great golden eyes my mother spoke of, and felt his two-note name, Dagon, drum against my bones. It gave my people an uncomfortable shudder. They are human through and through, nearly numb to truth as I now understand, but I was cracked open, my raw soul quivering and metamorphosing before this tremendous power. By the time I could think again, some in my party had started to argue with our hosts, these people of the deep. Who did these clammy Wang Jaru think they were? What abominable place did they come from? See his home, the Wang Jaru interrupted, pointing webbed fingers at the dark water. With mother and father forever. And why were they telling lies about Queen Mother Dea? Silence! I screamed. My people closed their mouths and hunched their shoulders. The Wang Jaru curled their lips, and the heavy blackness at the center of their eyes fell upon me. I want to hear what they have to say. They came from water. They are all descendants of Father Dagon and Mother Hydra, whose tentacles touch the surface from time to time. They reached out to the villagers of Junkuno and offered them enough fish and gold that they could gobble up nearly th three nearby settlements, including a struggling trade town, and prompt Alunijo to come bearing gifts and collecting tributes. The only tribute the Wang Jaru collected for all this prosperity was the chance to make hybrids. Strong, undying hybrids who would serve Father Dagon and Mother Hydra on the only terrain that posed a challenge. Land. Junkuno made a, pragmatic, a pragmatic decision, and many hybrids were born. Some hybrids looked just as amphibious as their Wangjaru parent. Others, like Dayach, were beautiful, with faces like drowned stars. Prince Sora was another beautiful hybrid, though he was raised in Alunijo and had no waking memory of mother or father, or the Wangjaru female who birthed him after meeting his father, King Tunga, on the beach. As a baby, Sora was brought to Alunijo and presented to his royal father. Here, the mouth gargled, your heir. King Tunga's queen was infertile. She had little choice. So, together, my mother and father made an empire for the Wang Jeru, for Father Dagon and Mother Hydra. Until Jaya Megalang killed my mother, until my father thought he could tame elephants. My stupid father. No wonder he failed. Fish do not tame elephants. The beach was cold. The night had endured forever. 
A clammy hand touched mine, and I took a sharp and painful breath. Take back the throne, princess. Make Elenigio great again, as your mother and father did. Show them what immortality means. You're the only one that can, Princess Dani. That time, it was one of mine, a human. My long-suffering people looked terrified. Their eyes swollen nearly as badly as the Wang Jaru's, but they let the Wang Jaru squeeze close and drool on their shoulders. Only one Wang Jaru gnawed a human. They were all my people now. Your brothers don't have the blood. But I only said yes after I asked the Wang Jaru what they wanted with an empire. They answered simply, Mother and father want to grow and be glorious. And we suddenly understood each other perfectly. I told my people to return to Aldenijo and stay quiet. To tell the court I'd drowned. I promised to return on the first Kliwan of the next month. We would need time for the swim and for me to grow my gills. I'll remember every one of you, I said. You will not be unrewarded. They kissed my hands, my alien hands, but they did not care. They loved me so, and said they would meet me at the beach. I might have cried if truth were an armor plating my heart. Then I turned, shed what remained of my soiled clothes, and went into the water. The sea was no longer dark, but glowing, not from moonshine, but from something deep and hidden, something within. The lumbering Wangjaru are full of grace beneath the waves, silken and smiling and cosmic blue, not gray. The music down below is overwhelming. My half-brother Arda was getting married. I didn't know the girl. I assumed she was some princess of another subordinate people. She seemed excruciatingly unhappy, even before I made it clear that I had not come back from the outer darkness to wish them well. I like to think that when I removed her head, I was saving her from a lifetime of pain. Arda ran as soon as the Wang Jaru climbed onto the stage, leaving behind his bride. This did not surprise me. He had shown me no loyalty either. Some warriors think family must take care of family. I respect such honor codes, but Arda surrendered the right to be killed by me. I was sent the Wang Jaru after him, after giving them license to consume. Best not to waste fuel, I say. But I did kill Jaya Megalang. Not to do him any honors, but to be sure he was dead. This was the man who had killed my mother and dug up her bones. After his bodyguards had been knifed or bitten or bludgeoned, after the wedding stage was swick, slick with blood, I approached him. I always knew you were a monster, he hissed. You and that damned witch, you called a mother. I should have slit your throat when you were a baby. Yes, we are monsters, I said, but so is my father. You live in a monster's empire. You're only upset because you're not the biggest monster anymore. You're mad. You're mad if you think you can run a kingdom with salamanders. Do they even have brains? His breathing was heavy. He was, finally, the fearful one. Or just teeth. I smiled. There are truth. And you only have lies. Truth is order, Prime Minister. And order is truth. I did not kill Murti. I saw him standing dumb like a manservant and told my army, both human and Wang Jiru, not to touch him. Instead, I let him stand in the corner of his unraveling world. And it was all over when I took my seat on the throne of Avanijo and lifted my bloody caress above my head. He knelt with the others. By then, it was dawn. Someone shouted, Hail Queen Dani, the Undying! And a great roar of triumph burst out from the sea, sending waves all the way to the coconut palms tied with batik, swaying high upon the sand. Ask about Queen Dani, the Undying, priestess of the faith, Shaman Queen, ask the traders and longshoremen at any of Asia's busy, busy harbors. 
Ask at any of the courts of Song, Chola, Khmer. Ask them if they have ever seen a dead Wang Zhiru. The answer will probably be no. If a sailor tells you he's killed one personally, you've met a liar. Ask to see something from an Alanija trader ship, and they may show you for a price. Alanija gold is probably their greatest treasure. You will not find it on the market, because no one ever parts with it. It is handed down on deathbeds, mother to daughter and father to son, often as little dancing idols fashioned in memory of me. If you ever see one in the Asian people's wing of some European history museum, not the arms. An Alanijo idol will have arms like a sea snake, or you could simply ask the curator if the museum is haunted. That will probably show you the truth. Ask, and you will hear fear. We weren't unfriendly, but we were ruthless. Our boats never sank. Even if they had, our people never drowned. When I was nearly 50, Father Dagon gifted me control over sea winds and currents. In the Indo-Pacific, that is all that matters. I only unleashed a monsoon once against overconfident Nippon. Fear did the rest. If you're lucky, you'll meet a true believer in this or that Abrahamic religion. To them, I am the demon queen. They'll say I was in league with Satan, even though I only ever served truth. And truth is brutal, yes. Truth does not care for human dreams. But I had no interest in converting anyone, least of all the weak and foolish, the ones unchosen by father and mother. Truth is order, and order is truth. Their place is down below, with the Shyamagaling and other detritus. Fears the primal god of humans. Anyway. If you are extraordinarily lucky and ready, you will find a man or woman who knows Relia. It happened to me when I was 412, and I met a shipwrecked chieftain from the Bird of Paradise, Papua Island. Queen Dani, he said, grinning to show his chattering teeth. I have been to the most amazing city. Insane people are the reason I never get bored. I usually let the Wang Jaru eat anything they pulled from the sea, but this time I stayed them. My guard, the latest I had named Little Murti, licked his grouper lips impatiently. What city, little man? I asked. Is it better than Xanadu? Oh, yes, Queen Dani. In his house at Relia, did Cthulhu waits, dreaming. Then he tumbled over laughing and promptly died. Little Murti asked for permission to eat him, which I gave with an absent nod. I had already begun once more to alter. I felt my blood boiling over. Let the rest of my sensory life go numb. I saw the lead ball of truth opening before my eyes, cleaving once, then again. When I turned 500, I left. I dove off my ship at sundown and swam away. By then, I took no joy in empire, the alliances and processions, the Shala Exotica. I thought of nothing but Relia of waking this high priest Cthulhu. I no longer cared for names, or faces, or food. I did not sleep. I saw my great empire for what it truly was, a pile of children's toys, nothing but a game. Father Dagon and Mother Hydra wrapped me in tentacles and whispered, This is enough. But enough was a compromise I was not willing to make. I know Alunijo died without me. I know the alliances broke and the hybrids disappeared into the mainland, and the Wang Jaru slipped back into the ocean, and Father Dagon produced no more gold. And eventually the tiny ships of Europe came whistling around the Cape and enslaved everything that had been mine. When I see Java floating on that glassy sea, I do worry that I have disappointed my parents, my birth mother Deach, that is, and my birth father Sora. They loved that island so, 
wanted only greatness for it. And now look. But truth was waiting for me in the South Pacific, and I had to heed that call. Homesick my mother was, and I am too, sometimes. I'm sure the pain gnaws, because I haven't found real yet. The high priest is not ready. The stars don't yet align. Every now and then, while I float on still waters and wait for Cthulhu's call, I go to my old southern shore and walk amongst the ruins. The brick split gate still stands, although my banyans died. New banyans grew in their place. I haunt whatever kingdom has taken root on my mother's bones. The Muslim sultans gave me new names. That is probably how you know me. Nyai Rorokidul, Queen of the South Sea, Spirit Queen. When the light is right, I can see in their eyes the odd devotion of my very first legion. But they claim to worship other gods now. Everything is veiled. I know you feel it too. Only the humming promise of Cthulhu remains. A final signal of truth emanated from some deep crevasse of the world. Listen.